Whenever you're ready. Hello, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for coming today. Um, please settle in and welcome to uh, our WL Mellon Speaker Series event. I'm Rasika Karve, first year MBA and the president of the Tepper Consulting Club. Uh, and I'm joined at the podium today by uh, my classmate, Anna Williams, who is the president of the Tepper Women in Business Club. Uh, and we are proud to be co-hosting today's event uh, and are delighted to have Janet Fauti, uh, Professor Laurie Wiengaard, and alumni Mia Parikh with us this afternoon. We are so excited. And at this time, we ask that you open any drinks, chips, unwrap anything, so that way we're not creating chaos during the presentation. Uh, we also ask that you please keep your cell phones and laptops stowed away and make sure everything's on silent. So again, we're not interrupting anything. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Dean Isabel Bajou, the Richard P. Simmons Professor of Finance and 10th Dean of the Tepper School of Business at Carnegie Mellon University, to formally welcome you and introduce our student or our guests. Thank you so much. So if you're done with your chip bags, <laughs> it is a uh, Absolutely a great pleasure to be with all of you today for this uh, special WL Mellon Speaker Series event. This uh, annual series is a long-standing tradition at the Tepper School that started in 2006. The series is designed to give students the opportunity to interact with global leaders, CEOs, and management experts. In addition to being joined by our students, we are delighted to have several partners from Deloitte who are also graduates of uh, Carnegie Mellon in the audience today. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to our guest of honor, Janet Foley, Executive Chair of the Board Deloitte US, and Laurie Wengard, Richard M. and Margaret S. Syed Professor of Organizational Behavior and Theory at the Tepper School of Business. Janet is a member of Deloitte's Global Board of Directors and chair of the Deloitte Foundation. She formerly served as CEO of Deloitte Consulting. While CEO, she led the digital transformation and growth of the $10 billion business through significant investments in digital, in artificial intelligence, and cloud. Janet previously led Deloitte's federal and technology businesses, which grew exponentially for organic growth, acquisition, and the launch of numerous businesses, including Deloitte Digital. Janet is a passionate advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion, women in technology, and the need for STEM education. She founded women in technology groups in India and in the US, and Janet has steered Deloitte's DEI efforts. She's committed to purposeful leadership and recognizes that business can and should make a broader societal impact that matters. Janet also serves on several not-for-profit boards. Janet is the co-author of the best-selling book, Arrive and Thrive. Seven Impactful Practices for Women Navigating Leadership. Our second guest of honor, Professor Laurie Wengart, in addition to her teaching and research activity, is Vice Chair of the Carnegie Mellon Faculty Senate and co-leads the Collaboration and Conflict Research Lab. She formerly served as CMU's Interim Provost and as a Senior Associate Dean within the Tepper School. Laurie co-offered the No Club, putting a stop to women's dead-end work. A research and teaching examine collaboration, conflict, and negotiation. She focuses on how differences across people both help and hinder effective problem solving and innovation. Laurie has published over 70 articles and book chapters in the fields of management, psychology, and economics. 
an elected fellow of the Academy of Management and recipient of the Joseph E. McGrath Award for Lifetime Achievement in the Study of Groups, Laurie served as president of the International Association for Conflict Management. She served as the founding president of the Interdisciplinary Network for Group Research and as editor of the Academy of Management Awards. We are absolutely delighted to have these notable thought leaders with us today. The students have prepared a variety of questions for you to discuss. I will now turn it over to Tepper alumna and Deloitte principal, Mia Parikh, class of 2012. Mia will be today's moderator. Thank you all for joining us to lead the conversation this afternoon. I'm looking forward to it. Mia, take it away. Awesome. Good afternoon, everyone. Everyone can hear me in the back. Quick head nods, fantastic. I'm so honored to be here today to be moderating this conversation with two very successful and inspiring women leaders. I'm just going to give you kind of the flow of the discussion today. Uh, thank you to the students and the board uh, and the clubs for sending the questions in advance. We've <laughs> handpicked a few questions that I'll be starting with. So we're going to do a little bit of uh, pre-selected questions that Janet and Lori will be answering. After that, we would love to hear questions from our live audience. So as they're talking, please think about what's top of mind, what are the types of things you'd love to hear Janet and Lori's perspectives on, uh, and then I'm going to open it up for Q&A. All right, so without further ado, let's get started. So again, thank you both Janet and Lori for doing this. Um, each of you have recently written very timely, pertinent books on leadership and thriving in the workplace. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about why you chose to write those books. So we'll start with you, Laurie. Sure, happy, happy to share. Um, so about 12 years ago, uh, some co work colleagues and I got together around the corner at a local restaurant and um, Union Grill and decided, <laughs> <laughs> we're here, um, and decided we, we needed to talk about our work lives. We, they were really out of control. We just were being asked to do things that, um, we didn't really want to do or didn't think was the best use of our time, but we had a hard time saying no. So we got together to try and figure out what we could do to help manage our careers and just get things aligned. Uh, we met regularly for a long period of time and we got better at saying no. But what we realized pretty quickly is that um, it wasn't fixing the problem. We kept getting asked to do all this extra work and it didn't seem like our male colleagues were being asked to do this work to the same degree. So we formed the I Just Can't Say No Club. But what we did in addition to navigating our own careers was we started uh, to do some research on um, what's going on here? Why are we being asked to do this extra work? And is this unique experience to women or is this happening to everybody to the same degree? So we did our research, we learned some more, we went to the literature, and what we realized is that the problem was a lot bigger than ourselves and there were things we could do to fix it uh, more broadly. So we knew we couldn't just keep this to ourselves. So rather than publish some academic papers and call it a day, we decided we really wanted to write a book that could help change the way organizations think about the allocation of work, you know, and how individuals can better navigate the types of things they're being asked to do, right? When we, so we talk about two aspects of work promotable work and non-promotable work. Non-promotable work is all the things we do that's important to the organization, but doesn't advance our careers. So we mentor other people, we serve on committees, we um, um, organize offsite events, we might even take notes at meetings or, or order lunch, but it's all this extra work that we do. And so we um, wrote this book in order to help people figure out the best way to be spending their times and to do their fair share and also organizations to think about how they're allocating this work to make sure that everybody that shares the load and the right people are doing the right jobs. Thank you. Yeah. 
You want me to jump in and talk yes. about that? Yes. Um, so first of all, it is great to be here with you all today. I've been to Pittsburgh um, to visit clients a number of times, but never been on campus. I actually delivered the commencement address a couple years ago, but virtually. So mm -hmm. that was much less lovely, this incredible day you ordered for me today. So thank you, and it's great to be with you all. I'm also delighted to see such a good mix of men and women um, in the conversation today. And we're going to talk about both our own experiences, our books, but a lot of this centers around great leadership. And so if you were assigned by a professor to be here, don't, don't say anything. Just take the, take the win and acknowledge you're here for the greater good. So I'm really thrilled to be here with you all. I will tell you that when you listen to both of our bios, as I was reflecting on them, how many books and papers have you published? I, it was so a very large number. Yeah. Um, I have not. Um, I'm a career consultant. Um, I actually do a lot of writing and speaking, um, but nothing to the level of published academic papers and not a book whatsoever. And if I had had a grand life ambition, which I have not, writing a book would not have been in it whatsoever. <laughs> However, um, I, we have a very close, we Deloitte have a very close relationship with the university in the Northeast, Simmons University, and our teams got together and asked the incoming president of Simmons and I if we'd be interested in writing a book on women's leadership. And I'll tell you, we both rolled our eyes and said, okay, that's the last thing that the world needs is another book on women's leadership. You know, there are, you can go to any bookstore, you know, any website and see a plethora of them. But we came up with this idea in thinking about how to talk about thriving in leadership not just surviving in leadership, not just living to see another day, but actually being wildly successful. And so we like that idea. We like the idea of an academic perspective and a very practical business perspective. We have a third author who's a leadership coach. So the three of us bring very different perspectives to the table than, than um, any one of us would individually. And then the real leap of faith we took is I opened my proverbial, well, it would have been a Rolodex. You all are too young to know what a Rolodex <laughs> is, but my proverbial contacts. And I thought about clients of mine that I wanted to reach out to to see if they would contribute to the book. And we had a little bit of a frame of what was important to us. And I will tell you, I've never been more nervous at hitting send on those emails. <laughs> because these are, some of these are clients I knew quite well, but some I did not know as well. And to say, I'm writing a book and I'd like you to contribute, like that's, that's like a big, bold, scary <laughs> ask. And when I realized we were onto something is that all 20 of the executives that I called came back and said they would contribute to the book. And 19 of them actually wanted to be interviewed, didn't just want to have their chief of staff write up some notes that they sent in. So from Beth Ford, who's the CEO of Land Lakes, to Albert Borla, who's the CEO of Pfizer, to Gail Boudreaux, who's the CEO of Anthem, now Elevance, we got incredible, incredible perspectives, not only from the three of us around what do women need to do, and I'm going to talk about men in a moment, to thrive in leadership. And it just created this really interesting, net new, very practical and very story-based conversation. I want to address talking to men and women today. We absolutely wrote this book for women. But as we were writing it, what we realized and the conversations I've been in um, for, for the last many sets of months, actually, I guess almost a year since this has been published, is a lot of what we talk about is very practical, actionable book for anyone wanting to, um, advice for anyone wanting to thrive in leadership. Lots of tools to use, lots of case studies and examples. So I'm really delighted that we've got a broad group here today to be in the conversation. Yeah. And I so, will say I read the book and I completely agree. It's great generalizable advice and it's also very evidence-based. And I really appreciated that. And I like lists and stories. Those are the two things I really like in life. <laughs> and if you happen to pick up a copy of the book, there are lots of lists and lots of stories. And that's really all that matters to me. So there you have it. <laughs> For sure. Lots of very practical and sort of touching stories throughout the book. Let's dive, do a little double click on that, as we have recently started saying. Um, so in Arrive and Thrive, you sort of have seven practical strategies for women and men to thrive in leadership. Um, let's deep dive into one of my favorites, which is cultivating courage. Mm. So Janet, I think the student audience here would love to hear two things from you. One is, how did you cultivate, cultivate your courage as you were going through the ranks and rising in your career um, at Deloitte? And then what advice would you give to the student body here about how they can cultivate yeah. their courage as well as a culture uh, where courage is, you know, um, is sort of permanent? 
Okay, there's a lot packed into that little question. <laughs> so let me try to dissect that a little bit. Um, let me start with a one second of backstory. I'm the daughter of a scientist and an, and an artist. So academia and art. And so I will tell you that when I entered the business community um, as a young 20 something, I was pretty clueless about what was courageous and what was not. Because I had no frame of reference whatsoever. I'd gone to business school, but it didn't give me sort of the frame of what the world would look like and what would be an act of courage and what would not. And what, what I've learned over the years is that um, I think about courage in a couple of ways. It is taking the leap to advance something that you believe in, um, and it is taking that leap when you are nervous or scared or afraid or, or unconfident. And so what you and I, any one of you and I could think about as a courageous act could be super different. Um, because courage is really defined on what makes you, what you believe in and what makes you uncomfortable, and that what what make that I believe is what makes a courageous act. Um, certainly, in um, in the types of, of roles and jobs and environments that we're all in, um, either now or in the future. I also think it's really important to think about little moments of courage and big moments of courage. And I will tell you that I've really only made three decisions in my life to date. Um, that I felt were courageous decisions. And before I tell you this, do not tell my husband I said it this way. Mm -hmm. So my three acts of courage were, one, deciding to join Deloitte. Um, the second was deciding to marry my husband. And the third is deciding to become a parent. Mm -hmm. Everything else for me, so career and life-wise, has kind of happened. I've not had any like big, deep moments of should I or shouldn't I. It's been much more organic. And you know, we had some interesting discussion beforehand about being super planful. I'm not a super planful person. And that actually takes a lot of the need for courage away. A lot of people would say it was courageous to come to business school. It was courageous to move to a new country. For me, those were not big leaps. Those just happened very easily. For me, where I've really built my courage is in having conversations, and I'll use the word conversation very broadly, about things that I thought people, either my clients or members of my team, needed to hear that were difficult things to deliver. And that's really how I built sort of my foundation of courage. I'm um, starting with my own teams in giving feedback. I'm um, building to giving clients really tough feedback that they may or may not want to hear. We have something within Deloitte called, and my Deloitte, few Deloitte colleagues who will, will nod, called Deloitte Nice. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have a really hard time telling people things they don't want to hear. But the reality is, as a consultant, we're getting paid to tell people what we believe and what we think is in their best interest, not always what they want to hear. So I basically built my sort of sense of courage and confidence in getting really good at doing that. And it sounds probably, some of you are thinking, well, that sounds pretty mundane or pretty straightforward. But that then gave me the courage to help make really big business decisions, enter new markets, exit markets. What do you do in a downturn? How do you navigate the pandemic? Mm -hmm. The courage that I got from practicing and all those little micro moments over the years at delivering a tough message or a hard message or a message someone didn't want to hear built my confidence to take those bigger courageous moments. And the last part of your question, which I'll try to address quickly, is how you do that. Um, and for me, it's very, very simple and straightforward, which is practice, 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 and test the things that you're nervous about. And you know, for those of you here who are students, you're probably thinking, OK, that is like the most boring advice and counsel I have ever heard. Um, but I can tell you that the discipline of getting ready for a courageous conversation, and I'll just build on the courageous conversation piece of my own courage, um, has been about thinking about the conversation, writing down what I want to see, testing it with trusted colleagues um, or friends or partners. Um, I will tell you, the first time I had to fire someone, my husband did not like that because I practiced the firing script on him. And he said he had nightmares for weeks. Um, but that is, um, that is what I found to be incredibly true. Real, a lot of discipline um, and, um, and a lot of practice at getting ready to be in those tough spots that really require every ounce of your courage. So those are a few of my musings. We could spend the entire hour just talking about that, but that's a little bit of my own journey um, around courage. Yeah, that's a very actionable trip, uh, a, a tip to give to our students. And speaking of firing, I actually do remember in communications class. If oh, no, I thought she was going to say, like, <laughs> <laughs> firing mishap. 
they made us fire one of our classmates as part of a communi- uh, communications class. I don't know if they still do that, but it was uh, it was a very tough conversation, even though it was not real. So I, you know, did you practice? I practiced because they made me fire a really dear friend of mine, and the look on his face was not one that I was happy to see. So you know, so I will say I just ran an exercise in class this past week where we did a role play of difficult conversations. I teach a class on conflict, oh. and. Um, uh, they had to fire someone. Yeah. So again, you know, this practice. We need to uplift this conversation <laughs> from firing because we're all just launching. So I don't want to take us too deep there. Um, but how do you do it with respect and with, mm-hmm. you know, empathy and, and support? And yes. that's good. No, I love the practice, practice, practice works on in many, in many areas. So we'll go a little bit into your book. So you talked about, you know, promotable tasks, not promotable tasks. Research has shown that, you know, women tend to take on disproportionate amount of these tasks. What advice would you have for you know, students about to start their careers on how they can better manage yeah. NPTs versus PTs or promotable tasks? Um, and also, I know you introduced a concept called work-work um, balance and imbalance. Maybe you talk a little bit more sure. about that. Yeah. I think before you can come up with solutions, you need to understand what the root cause is. You know, why do women end up doing more of this work than men? And what we found through our research, it, it, that it's really driven by these shared expectations that women get asked to do more non-promotable tasks, women are more likely to say yes, and women are even more likely to volunteer. And it's not because women are better at them or women want to do this work. It's because there are these shared norms that have developed that that's what women are happy to do. And by the way, men and women hold these norms and expectations. So as a result, you can imagine how this has becomes a self-perpetuating cycle. In fact, we um, have one organization we looked at where we were comparing the number of hours of non-promotable tasks that men and women were doing. And over a course of a year, we found that holding level of seniority constant, the women were doing 200 more hours of non-promotable tasks than their male colleagues every year. Right? That's like a month of extra work. And of course, it's got to t- the time has to come from somewhere. Either it comes from your personal time or it comes from your professional time. And when it comes from your other professional time, that's what leads to work, work, and balance, right? Your promotable task and the time you spent on that compared to your non-promotable task work is out of whack in comparison to everyone else you work with, right? So that's, the, that's where that concept kind of comes from, that idea, right? And, and what we found even in our own jobs is that we were spending a lot of time doing non-promotable work. You know, so I'm a faculty member, and so in, as a faculty member, uh, we call non-promotable work service. And we do service to the institution, and we do service to our profession. And in the institution at Carnegie Mellon, at, like at every university, mostly what we do is serve on committees, like because faculty play an oversight role. So the story I like to tell about you know this is that I've been on... Oh, you know, I've been at Carnegie Mellon my whole career. I've been on three building committees. I was on the building that designed the new wing of the old business school, the new floor of the new wing of the business school, and then this building. And there's nothing about my training. Good job, by the way. I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's nothing specific about being a professor of organizational behavior that makes me an expert in designing buildings. But sir, sure, over time, I got better at it. But it took a lot of time, and it takes time away from the work that I do get promoted for, which is my teaching and my research, right, which are the primary things. Okay, so, you know, so the question, of course, is, well, what can you do about this, right? And from, right, that was the question. Mm -hmm. I got way off that. All right. So, you know, what can you do to navigate this type of a situation? So everybody, you need to take a look at your portfolio of work. You look at the way you spend your time. Go back to your calendar and, or, or spend a couple weeks just keeping track minute by minute. If you're in a consulting field, you, keep, you bill clients. So you keep track of your billable time uh, in professional services. This is a, you have a nice starting point. But keep track of all that extra work that you do on the clock and off the clock and get a sense of that balance. Then start talking to peers to see what their workload is like and what you t- like. And what you typically can start doing is getting a sense of if you're doing more of it than others, what are you doing? Are you doing the work that's fulfilling to you? How, and what's the implications for your access to your promotable work at the same time? And so as an individual, you can start navigating the situation by 
um, starting to say yes to the more important work and no to the less promotable work. But I want to put a caveat on this, right? Because, you know, when we think about saying no, um, for men in the room, you, you, there's more degrees of freedom for you to say no because you're, there's lower expectations for you to do this work. But remember, this is driven by expectations. So when women say no, they're violating an expectation, and there's a cost that comes along with that. There's more of a penalty. You might not be seen as the team player. You might feel guilty. There may not be other opportunities or people may write you off. So women have to be more careful in how they say no to avoid the negative repercussions. Um, and, but through this process of saying no in a more effective way and getting your work, you know, thinking about what's promotable and not promotable, working with your leadership and management to um, offload those tasks that aren't a good use of your time so you can do that work that is going to help the bottom line of the organization more directly. All those are things you can do to bring your work-work balance into line. Um, and what we you know, see is there's a lot of low-hanging fruit here, things that individuals can do to navigate the situation. But unfortunately, you know, it doesn't solve the root cause, which are these expectations, which we can talk about later. Yeah. So if I could just add maybe two, mm-hmm. two of my own reflections um, on the work and the conversation. Um, for um, me- the men in the room in particular, you know, one of the things I talk a lot about is the best executives of the next generation are those that can build the most diverse and most inclusive teams. The issues that we are facing today, I mean, the things that I'm grappling with on an everyday basis are so broad and so many of them are so out of my area of expertise that I need a really smart and diverse group of people to help me solve those. And so as you think about launching the next chapter of your career and being really tuned into how to create an environment for a wide set of people to be wildly successful, keep this idea in your brain about, am I asking someone to do on my team a non-promotable task or promotable task? Am I you know, over-vectoring those to women? I guarantee you, you will have a much more effective team over time if you do exactly what Lori's talking about well. Um, and, you know, I would encourage men to also think about non-promotable tasks because, by the way, some of them probably are dumb and don't need to be done, right? Some of them are in service to the organization, but, you know, could that committee live with four people instead of five or three people instead of five? You know, be fearless about sort of challenging the norm. So that's a broad commentary. Now I want to talk about a little bit about me personally and how I've adapted um, to this frame, which I did not have the luxury of having early in my career, and 100% I would fall victim in every checkbox um, that you would have to being someone who was not good at saying no and saying yes to everything that came my way. What I was, and I would actually say that one of the reasons that I have the privilege of being in front of you today is the experiences I got, not just from serving my clients and building those businesses, but actually from doing the things that were viewed as less glamorous. In professional services, it's all about talent. It's all about people. And I spent a lot of my night, weekend time, extracurricular time, work, work time in and around people-centric things in Deloitte. And that gave me an opportunity to take my first P&L, which was not even in a domain of the business that I had worked in because... People had seen, oh, she's really good at bringing a group of diverse people together. She's really good at um, helping navigate complex issues with a diverse group of people. What I was good at was two things. One is figuring out for the non-promotable tasks, um, how do I make the best of it? So one of the things I wanted to work on was my public speaking. So at internal Deloitte events, which no one pays attention to, no one measures, and certainly were not viewed as promotable, I would always be the one to speak. And I was, so I was practicing my public speaking. I was broadening my relationships. So I was looked for the silver lining in what I could get better at in whatever I was doing. The second thing is I was also good at, once I got a little ways into whatever that thing was, handing it off to someone else. Mm-hmm. And that was actually not because I was trying to ditch the, well, maybe a little bit of trying to ditch the less glamorous work, <laughs> but also because I was then gifting someone else the opportunity to be on campus and help recruit the next class of analysts to run the events in the office on Fridays and get their opportunity to speak and build their network. So both very symbiotic. So I love the frame. I think it's super important um, as, as future leaders to understand this framework, regardless of whether you're applying it to yourself or your team, but also think about 
how for the things that you're doing, even in your case groups here today, how you can make the best of those and advance your own yeah. development through the work that is viewed as less glamorous or less promotable. And I'm going to ping pong that back because <laughs> that's such a sorry, great story. Sorry, just run no, totally sorry, over yeah, your I'm agenda. Like, you, know, okay. you know, what's great about that, that story is that it's talking about leveraging the non-promotable tasks for your future, right? So they're really these tasks become indirectly promotable. They're not going to help you today, but they might help you tomorrow. And if you leverage those strategically, you can benefit from them. Right, so you get the face time, you and develop a skill set simultaneously. So you're developing skills for the future, and you were, um, and you were getting you know in front of people that you wouldn't otherwise. So it's that's very positive strategic way to leverage that those types of work, and that's actually what I found was most successful for me is finding the non-promotable tasks that were right for me. You know, if you listen to my bio, I've done a lot over the. You know, a lot of different things. I've served in different leadership roles on campus. I've led professional associations. I edited a journal. I'd, but if you, if you look at it, you know, over time, you see that these were things that I loved to do. They were things that I was passionate about. They were in domains I cared about. And so the time I spent on those non-promotable tasks, because remember, they didn't get me tenure, they didn't, you know, maybe they would recognize in terms of status, but they didn't really buy me much. Um, they were fulfilling mm -hmm. and they were energizing. And so as a result, you know, it was right for me in, in terms of how I sustain my, you know, energy and contribution over the many years. Yeah, I love that. In your book, you mentioned like four reasons why you should take on NPTs. Fulfilling is one of them. If you can practice another skill, that's another one of them. So there's valid reasons to take on these tasks. But like Lori said, you have to look at your portfolio, have to be intentional about it. Um, I do have more questions, but I want to be mindful of time and give you all an opportunity to ask questions based on the lively dialogue we've, we're having or anything else that's on your mind. So I'm just going to give it a quick pause to see, are there any questions that the audience has at this time? Yes, go for it. Do you mind standing up, please? And could you introduce yourself, please? Hi, my name is Andrew Sinzega, second year MBA student. Um, so, so. <laughs> <laughs> and you get to a position maybe where there's not as many females in positions above you and that can be mentors or, you know, supporters of your career. How did you kind of navigate that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, oh. I didn't talk much about my actual, so thank you for that question and very nice to meet you. Um, I didn't talk much about my actual career path aside from my current sets of titles, which are just not that interesting, but um, I actually grew up at the intersection of Wall Street and technology. And as you can imagine, um, in the 90s, before I fear many, some of you were born, I won't think too much about that, um, there were not women there either. Um, either in my clients or within my own organization. So I pretty much lived my whole career um, being in male-dominated cohorts. Um, I will tell you that at the start of my career, I was just oblivious. Um, I was doing my work. I was doing the best work I could. And I didn't, frankly, think much of fact about what the diversity of the team looked like. Um, you know, I said I came from this sort of academic family, and that just wasn't something that we spent a lot of time talking about. So I was sort of one foot in front of the other. As I advanced in my, in my career and became a young parent is where it became much more clear to me, actually. So it was sort of the intersection of my professional life and my personal life that, um, that sort of highlighted to me, like, oh. Who do I actually talk to about any of this? And that was a really important moment um, for me personally in terms of sort of realizing that um, not only did I have to figure out how to, how to look for places to, to build relationships and strength um, across a broad set of people, but also that I was then sort of by default becoming the proverbial role model, and I can talk about what's good and bad about role models, but becoming that without even really thinking about it. And so for me... Um, I was pretty fearless about asking people for advice and counsel, men and women, pretty fearless about going outside of my direct network because, again, Wall Street in the 90s and early 2000s, there weren't a lot of women to call on. So I would fi find women sort of in my client organizations. I would pick brains of the men that I worked with. Um, 
so that's, I, I was pretty organic in the way that I did that. Um, but it is, it is so much more the center of the conversation. I mean, when I was in business school, this is not a conversation we'd be having. And I think this conversation is so important for men and women because, and I, I know you had allyship on your list, but I talked earlier about those that can build the most diverse teams will be the most successful. I deeply, deeply believe that. And that is, one, having people who are good mentors who you can talk to. Two, having good allies, people who understand where you're coming from and your point of reference. And three, those that you can sponsor, places where you use your political capital to help others be successful. I was incredibly lucky. People use their political capital to help me, men and women, over the course of their career because I was not a 42 long average normal Deloitte consultant. For those who are not US, I just realized I was not being very inclusive. 42 long is my code name expression. Does everyone know what 42 long means? Okay, so 42 long um, is what is, oh, now I'm like blushing. I don't embarrass very easily. And I just use that expression without thinking about it. So that would be your typical Wall Street executive men's suit size. So <laughs> do we have a couple of 42 longs here? Okay, so um, that would be your very average, yeah, my Deloitte partners who are just my nice, you know, five foot eight height, I won't call on them. Um, that is what you'd think of as your very stereotypical, like Wall Street bro man in the, in the 80s yeah. and 90s, what suit size they would wear when everyone wore suits. And so that is 42 is the... Jacket size. Jack, no, but the, your shoulder, shoulder size shoulder and length width, yeah. is how tall you are. Yeah. You're not telling my husband I did not know that either. <laughs> um, so that would be, I was not that typical um, profile. And so people use their political capital for me. And I've then in turn obviously felt I need to pay it forward in a really big way. And that's where I've been very focused. Yeah. Actually, let me just close with one funny story. Because I said I did not realize that I was the only woman in the room. Um, but there was a moment, and this is both a coaching moment for me and for all of us. Um, I am not a golfer. You probably guess I did not grow up in a golf family um, and have basically no interest in the sport of golf whatsoever. And I was on my second project with the firm, All Men, and the project partner said that we're going to take a day, a full day, and we're going to go play golf. <sighs> And I gasped. I was like, oh, this is not going to go well. Maybe my career is ending right here. And he, I think he saw a little bit of the look on my face. And he goes, oh, Janet, it's fine. You can go shopping with my wife, Lenore. And then we'll meet you at the country club for dinner. And so I did realize, I really actually thought that was about golf. But I actually realized in retrospect that that was about gender as well. Mm -hmm. And in his defense, he was actually trying to rescue me. I did not go shopping with her, by the way. <laughs> I did not think that was a good strategy. Um, so, so I've had these little, like when I look back, there have been these moments where it became super clear um, that I had to be um, um, sort of tuned into the conversation in a very different way and what I said yes to in terms of the work that I did, but also the events I chose to go to. And his wife was lovely, but I did not see that as the best use of my day. <laughs> And I still do not play golf or have any interest in golf whatsoever, which is better for the whole universe of golf. So. <laughs> well, thank you, Janet, for normalizing, not knowing about golf or playing golf or being interested. It's helped people like me who are also not interested in golf. Um, so just I'm going to give, you know, uh, Professor Weingart a chance to maybe lean in as well, because allyship is an important component throughout your book as well. So yeah, yeah. any thoughts you want to add around how men and women can be allies? Um, on this matter? Yeah, you know, it, it's, your point is so well taken, you know, in terms of that everybody plays a role in, in this and we all need to support one another. And the, uh, you know, change doesn't happen through individuals, change happens through a collective. And, and the beauty about thinking about at least how non-promotable work is allocated um, is that there are some easy fixes and we can all make small adjustments to solve the problem. Right, because women are often, you know, underrepresented in the professions, in many of the professions. And so if 20% of the women are doing 70% of the non-promotable tasks and you just redistribute the work a little bit and get rid of the ones that don't need to be done um, <laughs> and make some promotable that should be promotable. So there's all these strategies in place. You know, there's ways to redistribute the work so everybody 
um, does their fair share in the load on the everyone else is much lower. So there's there's solutions here. Um, allies. So you know, allies can come from peers, and allies can come from leadership. And in terms of peers, you know, there's simple things we can do about um, stepping in before someone is voluntold to do a task. Right? Have you ever been in a meeting where someone? Well, this happens, you know, to me even, but and, and has a many to others as well, when you're in a meeting and you're looking for someone to volunteer to set up the next meeting or order lunch or take the notes and write up a report, right? And someone says, well, Lori did it last time and she did a great job. You know, maybe she can do it again. Lori, what do you think? And, you know, it's very difficult to respond. So the allies can step in in little ways to interrupt that and say, well, I, you know, and I've done this before for junior people, say, well, you know, Roz has done this before, you know, maybe Oliver can do it. So I'm making this up. I know I'm my peers in the room. I just made that up, I swear. But, um, but, you know, there's ways we can interrupt just to make sure everybody's doing their fair share. There's other people in the organization who are influenced and impacted by um, inequitable allocation, and people of color also face this type of um, of over allocation of non-promotable tasks, but for different reasons, right? So for women, it's often because we're kind of viewed as the helpers. For people of color, men and women, it's because when you're underrepresented, you often get tapped to represent your group in, in every activity under the sun, even when it's not necessarily relevant, right? And so if we can be more thoughtful about how we're allocating work and uh, to people of color, that if there is some DEI work that needs to be done and we need those voices, that we give them the space to do it so it doesn't cut into their promotable work, so it doesn't interfere with their um, pr career progressions. And this is how we can work as allies in order to can, you know, make the work more equitably distributed. And leaders play a really important role in this, mm -hmm. right? Because we allocate the work often, you know? I'll, I'll give one story. You know, one example is when I moved into the senior associate dean role here at the Tepper School, you know, I had an opportunity to look at how committee work was assigned to all the faculty. And yeah, it was all in individual records, but no one had really put it all in one place to say, here are the people, here are the non-promotable tasks, and here's who's doing what. So at least we took a first cut at it, and we put together a spreadsheet with tick marks. Here are the tasks, here's the people, here's who's assigned to them. And we saw the distribution was skewed in one direction for the men and the other direction for the women. And because I was in a leadership role, we could reallocate the work. It's a simple fix, right? And it really didn't overburden the men. You know, there was just men who were doing nothing and women who were doing five committees, you know, and that we could fix that. And so um, we did. And, you know, again, it's a way that managers can play an important role. I think the other important role is educating people, especially your younger colleagues, your newer colleagues, in terms of what's promotable and what's not promotable. And that's a really strong mentorship role as well as um, allyship role that someone can take in supporting um, individuals and being able to navigate their careers. Sure. Any other audience questions? Yes, go for it. I do have a school by school competition um, of most interesting questions. So you guys are doing great. <laughs> oh, pressure. But I'll, we'll want, we need to keep it going. So No pressure, right? <laughs> so, yeah, uh, my name is Anitya Srivast, the first year student here at Carnegie Mellon. Um, my question is uh, you're talking about non promotable and promotable tasks. Um, some of the tasks that I did uh, prior to coming to business school, especially the non promotable ones, for me were quote-unquote failing, I would say. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. would you say that companies should also start to look at some of these non-promotable tasks and treat them like promotable yeah. tasks? Um, so that way it can kind of like shift how people view those activities. In person. So you yeah. should answer that, but then I want to... Yeah, you on. need to talk to, talk to this one. <laughs> yeah, be, right. So the answer is yes. And this is kind of that off comment I threw out is saying make a non-promotable task promotable. And the way an organization can do that is look at what they value. Look at your value statement and say, you know, what are the principles we stand by? And are we recognizing activities that align with that in our performance evaluations? Do they count? For real, not just to, like a check the box. And the value-driven organizations are very good at paying attention. And a great example of this are activities around DEI, right? Because organizations, some walk the talk. And they look at, say, here's what we value in terms of our efforts. Here are the groups, the employee resource groups, or the activities we do to promote 
uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belongingness. And we are paying attention to what people are doing. We're giving them credit. And they're getting increased pay, increased promotion promotion, put on a fast track. We see how they're contributing to the climate of this organization because, you know, about 70% of organizations value climate improving activities, but only about 30% of organizations actually reward them right now. So there's a, your point is so well taken. There's a huge gap and a huge opportunity. So I I think that's really well said, um, but I would put a note of caution around that because I've certainly seen this, um, probably a little more pre-pandemic, um, but now as well, is that within professional services firm, there's client work and, and what we call extracurricular work. So sort of above and beyond your day job of serving your clients. And I've certainly seen in all of the enthusiasm for extracurricular work, whether that's going back to campus and recruiting, whether that is running a diversity program, that some of our young um, some of our young leaders can get um, distracted, um, distracted isn't the right word, um, subsumed by their extracurricular work and lose their focus on their client work. Mm-hmm. And there absolutely are career paths where you can be a recruiter um, and you can move to our recruiting organization. Um, and that's a fabulous career path. But I think there's this balance of, of how do you take your non-promotable tasks either insert the things that you're enthusiastic about and insert them into your day job um, and or think about if it's really what you love as a topic, maybe there's a different role that will give you the space to do that. It's a really interesting balance and it's changed a lot um, Mm -hmm. in the last sets of years. And I love that we have sort of the space and time and enthusiasm Mm -hmm. for a broad set of topics, um, but it can't be at the expense of developing the skills and capabilities that you need to do sort of the, 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 the sort of core function of the job or the role. Yeah. And so that's, I think, a really interesting evolution of this topic um, with, with um, your generation and maybe a half a generation behind you um, in terms of how you, how you create what a really full work portfolio looks like and mm-hmm. how you balance all that. And so understanding what, what the expectations are and how that is complemented by non-promotable things that you're enthusiastic about, I would encourage you to be really thoughtful and tuned into that um, and really transparent about that because I've seen people get off the rails. Um, we say, well, Deloitte says this is super important. It is 100%, um, but, there is, but, it's, but it needs to be right. in balance right. um, with, with the things that yeah. for us that our clients expect us to do. Right. So. Yeah, absolutely agree. And so it's a difference between an organizational response and how the individual needs to navigate it, right? You, um, the, uh, we, and we've heard story after story of employee, newer employees walking into early performance evaluations expecting to hear positive feedback regarding all this extra work that they did. And it was just a footnote because your promotable work is what you were hired to do. And that's what brings value add to the organization. And that's what you need to keep the, your eye on the ball. It's tricky. This, it's not a black and I love the question. It is definitely not a nice, neat um, conversation. But I think one that's going to continue to evolve as well. And I guess the, the more you can embed the things that you're passionate about and love into your day job, the better. Be intentional. Think about your portfolio. So we're... A little bit running out of time, so I'm going to ask our speakers to wrap up with sort of one final broad overarching question. You've got this amazing student body in front of you. What final advice would you like to give them you go first. or have them take away from this? That's always hard after, you know, you want to wrap up. Um, <laughs> well, I guess I'll keep to my theme. You know, I'm also very mindful of this issue of courage and con- thinking about that and, and leadership and tying into early career courage, right? And what does it mean to be courageous as you're developing yourself as a leader? And I think um, the, the takeaway for me um, so much is across the two is this idea of intentionality, which you mentioned, um, and being you know, courageous in making those intentional decisions about how to spend your time in terms of career advancement thinking about what you need to do, being able to say no and how to say no um, so that you, um, you walk away at the end of the day taking the path that 
at least when you, in hindsight, you're happy, right? You may not have planned it out because I'm not, a, you know, I didn't know I'd be sitting here today writing, having written a book or even, you know, having done what I did, but you're there. And I guess the other piece of advice I would give, uh, you know, we, we talk about women a lot in our book and how um, women are overburdened with non-promotable tasks and about saying no. And, and I want to speak, you know, again, to um, the men in the audience and thinking about not only your work portfolio and the balance and getting it right, you know, vis-a-vis the larger organization and meeting those expectations, but recognizing that, you know, every time you say no, man or woman, it's more likely another woman's going to pick up the slack because the work still has to get done. So I think we all play a role in um, ensuring that, you know, our organizations thrive, that individuals can advance and thrive. And it's really, you know, for the good of um, our institutions. And if people around us are thriving, so will we. Beautifully put. Um, I guess I would just compliment that. Um, um, I also um, have not, as said earlier, have not had a grand life plan. And for those of you who have one, fabulous. And for those that you do not, it will all be okay, I promise you. Um, you would not be here. You are obviously enormously talented and driven. And I guess that would be my advice is to not get too caught up in the day-to-day of the day-to-day of is this all going according to plan and to get comfortable that things are going to go really, really, really off plan along the way and that that's okay because you are smart enough, talented enough, and driven enough that it, 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 is, it is all going to be just fine. And maybe I'd compliment that by talking about guilt. So I talked a little bit about my parents um, being an artist and a scientist. That what I didn't share is that um, my mother is Italian Catholic and my dad is Jewish. And so we have guilt from both sides of the family <laughs> um, in a big way. And one of the things I figured out is um, over the course of my career is um, if I'm ever feeling too much anxiety or guilt in any given sort of series of days over the course of a month, that whether that's between work, work tasks or work home, um, that something has to give if that guilt meter is going up too much. And to get comfortable that you'll have a thousand opportunities to pivot the sets of choices that you make over the course of your career and not to be stuck in something where you have, where you're not feeling great about how you're contributing professionally, to your own growth and development in the things that you love to do and to what's important to you um, outside of your, of your work life. I've, I've taken many twists and turns. I did part-time work um, um, as a new mom. I took roles that were absolutely not career advancing because they were not right for where I was in the moment. So to get comfortable that there will be lots of twists and turns and you all are going to be amazing um, at, how you, at how you navigate and to not worry if those twists and turns don't go according to plan. So that is, my, that is my counsel to each of you as you're either starting your business school career um, and or launching, um, launching into your next chapter. Love that. Worry less. All right. If you can please give a round of applause to our speakers. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was just amazing. I hope we won the contest of the best 100%, questions. 100%. <laughs> and uh, obviously, you know, a lot of what was mentioned here resonated with me uh, at a very personal level. And uh, what I really like is, what I really love is that we're able to have these conversations. Uh, it feels that back in the day, we were not having this kind of conversation. And this is where probably we didn't make as much progress as we should. So, Janet, to co- commemorate your time with us at Tepper, and uh, Laurie, your special role today, I am very pleased to present you both with this WL Mellon Speaker Series oh. pack. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you, thank you so much for spending this time with us and uh, for all of the words of wisdom. Thanks for the thank opportunity. You. Thanks so much. Thanks.